Uh, we've got some time for questions. Uh, I can come to you. Um, let's keep them questions and not long commentaries and things like that. So uh, that way we can get as many questions in as possible. So any questions, Abby, I knew. We currently live in a world right now that they don't even know that they need hope. And we're um, hanging out with believers that are deconstructing at a really alarming rate. So how do you talk to a world that says, uh, I'm fine, I don't need hope? Okay. Well, the, the fact is, Abby, they do need hope. They may not, they may not admit it, but, but hope is an existential need of all human beings. I mean, you get up and go out in the morning because you have hope. There's a basic level of hope of, you know, you hope that you'll live today, you hope that you'll be healthy today. So it's unavoidable. The question is what we're hoping in or what we're silencing, what we are silencing out by noise, by music, by drugs, by alcohol, by sex, by whatever it is. There are all kinds of ways we avoid reality because reality can be too painful. The Christian has to learn to be winsome and careful. We don't want to scare people. We're not trying to hurt them. But sometimes what God might use us is to unravel the threads a little bit to get them to think. And so the witness is basically you cannot give what you don't have. So one thing is, am I living in hope in such a way that my life is at least, I'm not perfect, but I show that I, my trust is in Him, that I'm, my future is in Him, I rest in that, and I take the opportunities where they come. So I think just sow the seeds. Truth, goodness, and beauty are their own reward, and they are the right things to do. Treat people with respect, show them love, Give them grace, and then and be praying. Just say, Lord, let's have some let's have some fun. See what happens. Get some divine surprises during the day. Anyone else? We're going to go back and forth, front and back, just to make sure I get my steps in right. Uh, thank you so much for what you you had to say. Really, the Holy Spirit really touched my heart with it. Uh, I hate evil. And uh, Christians talk a lot of, Christians in my family talk a lot about evil. Yeah. So um, we don't want to get caught up in talking about evil. So how do, we, how do we deal with facing the anxiety associated with just the wickedness in our world today? Because I, I just hate it. Yes, I think, well, here's the, here's the thing. I mean, anybody who is involved, if you're, if you're a teacher in the school, uh, someone uh, dealing, uh, someone in the military, a police person, every, we all deal with difficult life around us. The problem, I think, for sometimes, there's a certain approach to Christianity where we concentrate on the disease and not on the, the answer. And so we need to find a way for us. I hate evil too, and the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's one of the things you should hate. But the question is, how do I hate evil and not become obsessed by it? How do I become more focused on God and the gospel and the glory of what God can do? In most of the darkest places, one of the things I've seen in my history of mission, um, and Jerry, uh, who's out at the moment, I think in Turkey, will probably will back this up from the things that he has seen. In most of the darkest places, and I have found Christians every time, been on the streets of Bombay, been in, in places, backstreet bazaars, sex trafficking today where it's going on, there are Christian ministries right there, always in the darkest places. Sometimes it was people were sent in there. Often it's just something that happens in no resources, no money, They've got the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, and the hunger, and they're doing something different. So I think our antidote to evil is not get overwhelmed by it, but to say, I mean, we, we trust Christ for his compassion. We ask him for his power. I mean, remember, Jesus wept when Lazarus, they came to the tomb. Why? Because he saw what sin was doing. He saw the death that, that Lazarus died because of sin. And Jesus wept. It wasn't a gesture. It, wasn't a, it was a genuine grief of the Creator over the tragedy in his cosmos. So we can imagine he weeps over sin, and he does. But the gospel is here. Christ is the way. There is a power. There is hope. So I think concentrate a little bit more on the gospel and let that maybe be the good antidote. Okay. What would, oh, I don't have to hold that. What uh, would you say to someone who wa watches the news a lot and says that they want to understand what's going on in the world. And yeah. obviously, we, we don't want to put our heads in the sand, but what do you say Yeah, but that see, person? yes, what would I say to someone who watches a lot and then says, don't put your head in the sand? That's become a cop-out now to me. I, um, you know, I grew up in a world 
uh, and I am older, where you know you got the news largely one a day, and I find that despite 24/7, I'm not any better informed than I was then. We had the BBC, or here in America, NBC, and you know Walter Cronkite and all this kind of thing. We we sort of laugh and mock at them. But the fact was, they gave us a summary of the news, and you generally had, a, or you could buy a newspaper. Now we have access to hundreds of stations, and we think 20. What do we want to know all this for? Stephen Covey famously in his, uh, his, his training for leaders, he talked about a, a threefold circle, a circle of concern, a circle of uh, uh, understanding, and a circle of focus. And what has happened is through the internet, where we've made the circle of concern, uh, our circle of influence was the middle one, so important that we're, we're concerned about everything. We have no influence on it, and we have no ability to do anything about it. But boy, we're angry. What can we do? We can write emails about it to each other. We can send texts to you. Did you know what's going on there? Did you know? And that means being informed. It becomes moral outrage with no actual moral ability to change anything. And the time that could be used by helping a neighbor, cooking a meal, serving someone. So I would say, have a balanced eye. I switch on the news about once a day. I'll turn on and I'll listen, I'll get the headlines. If there's something deeper, I'll go looking for it. I know, I know where to go. You, there's plenty of outlets. You can Google it and find it. Get the re and then switch it off. I don't need to know everything about everything. I don't need the latest. I don't need to know what the president had for breakfast or what he did with his dog last week. I mean, who cares? I don't need all the commentary from the Comedy Central either. So I think, again, it's a balanced diet. If if I go out and say, look, oh yeah, um, I want to know about sugar products. I'm going to eat all the donuts in the world and all the cookies and everything because I want to try them all. I mean, sometimes I think we approach the spiritual life, you know, in, as if we, we know that that would be absurd to go in and just keep eating food and it would be, end up looking like a mountain and, or dying very quickly. And yet somehow we think that information is different. There's no need for nutrition. There's no need for barriers, no need for boundaries. Of course there is. Junk food will kill your soul. And junk food is killing the soul of many Americans. So I would say, get on a diet. Yeah, and the irony is, uh, I listened to some journalists discussing research that just came out, said that those who take the news in a lot are, are less informed because they get caught up in circles. Mm. So less is more Feedback uh, loops, on yeah. that. Ryan. So you just talked about uh, this idea of influence and, and something I've been thinking about for a while is what is a, a Christian's responsibility to influence culture? Yeah, we have gone back, we've made a royal mess of this one because that question is a very good question. You're right, we do need to ask what is our role. We have a response, of course we do. But again, I would go back to the Sermon on the Mount and, and what are the, the baseline truths that Jesus said, Jesus said? We said we're the salt of the world and we are the light of the world. So to be salt and light is to be in the mix. We've got to be in culture, be there. We've got to be a presence. We've got to live winsomely, holistically. We've got to exercise responsibilities, be the best we can, be best professionals, doctors, lawyers, mothers, fathers, artists, painters, whatever it is. But when that translates into we must control the agenda and, we, and it always becomes about power, then I have a problem. Because the early church didn't ask those questions. The early church didn't have power. Didn't have power amongst the Jews in the beginning, carry out the Jewish, and it was religiously kicked out. It didn't have power with the Romans, as we know, until many centuries in. So this preoccupation with power and control, and I'm not saying we abandon into pure pietism. We've got to responsibly do the best we can, but it's a, make, a mix and a muddle. I think we're a little bit more now, I'd, you'd have to look, I think, more to people like Bonhoeffer now in our time. What does it mean to live in when culture really begins to go very dark, when things are difficult? How to be a responsible Christian? Well, we get up, we, we, make, our, we make our breakfast in our family, we look after our kids, we look after our, our property as best we can, we do the best job we can with the tools we have, we treat people with respect, we serve with dignity, we try to contribute, and if we can stand for justice and there's issues, we exercise the rights or authorities we have. But what we must not do has become ages believing that, that, that physical power and controlling and dominating becomes our agenda, as I think for many Christians it does. And that question is which kingdom we're serving. Anyone else? Yes, you may. You waited till I was up front again. 
<laughs> we, we, need, we need the exercise. Uh, another question. I, I think uh, part of the challenge is we don't want to be our own echo chamber. You know, part of the challenge today is that I hear that algorithms are being used to segment people by their identity based sure. on what they agree with. We don't want to be that way. Right. So how do we as Christians not be that way when sometimes the things we're learning, like even here, yeah. are even difficult to communicate with people that call themselves Christians? Well, I mean, th that's right. We don't want to all live in echo chambers, and to some degree we're going to because we have to also associate with people of like-minded to some degree. The question is if I balance that by, by talking to people who I don't agree with. Do I spend time with them? Do I have friendships? And do I allow them to speak? I find that oftentimes when we're in conversations of that, we start a conversation these days and someone just basically dominates and shuts the other person up. Um, so the question of trying to, uh, there are good attempts at this and there are group, people are learning to do this, trying to get people who want to listen. So look, you're gonna, you're gonna be uncomfortable and hear some things and you don't need to agree which was the old idea of what tolerance actually meant. I don't have to approve your ideas. I don't have to accept your ideas. I can, I can accept you as a person and still disagree with your thought. But that takes courtesy, and it, take, it's, it, it is work. It's hard. It's not easy to do, but it's possible. And I think those are places where Christians can make a difference. When, they, when anyone comes across a Christian who's willing to listen, they're always surprised. It's not because that we, don't, we don't all do it, but, but some of us don't do it. Some of us are only used to preaching, you know, and, and we, we, we don't do evangelism. We do a form of gospel mugging. You know, you get the Bible and you're whacking people over the head with it, and when, you know, that's not going to convert anybody. No, that's our job to convert them anyway. That God converts them. We witness. Show them love. Show them truth. And be willing. Rejection is a part of the gospel. He was rejected. So will we be. We just don't have to earn it on our own terms. Let it be because of the offense of truth, not because of being an offensive person. I'll, I'll ask one for you. This may be a softball, Stuart. Yep. You mentioned uh, Romans 12, 2, and uh, not to be transformed by the removing of your mind. Yep. For someone who is looking to get a start in growing their heart and mind, um, where, were, where would you suggest? Are there some basic books that might be a good starting point for folks in this to help yeah, I mean, them well, grow in this? Where, other, other than your book in the lobby, where would you start with? <laughs> I mean, I think there are some classic introductory texts like, you know, um, uh, John Stott's Basic Christianity, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ABC books. If I don't know my faith, then surely I need to study it and get to what are the basic truths of the Christian faith and study in the Gospels. There are tools, I think, um, from our own ministry, Reflections Ministry, we, you know, Ken uh, uh, offers a lot of basic Bible study tools on how to get into the Scriptures and get into the narrative yourself. You know, rebuilding your broken story, uh, living in the presence of God, shaped by suffering. Those are three titles that come off that I, I was looking at recently. I thought these are great for, for churches just to look at the narrative, what it means to live with God and to be fra framed by God. So I think that there's, there's a plethora of material out there, but the question is get started. Don't wait. Get together with a few friends. Get the Bible open. Get the Scriptures. It doesn't have to be some massive theological study. Listen to the Scriptures. Get to know the Word of God. And if you don't know the answers, you can turn to all kinds of places for help these days. I mean, you're in Wheaton, for goodness sake. One of the greatest colleges in the world is right here. And Moody and others. So there are resources but we have to have the will and take the time to, to go after that. So. And the C.S. Lewis Institute. Young man over there. <laughs> oh, sorry, the C.S. Lewis. Did I miss that one? Yeah, I'm just teasing. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for coming. This is really timely and relevant. Uh, we're having an alpha course at my church. Wonderful. And we were talking about faith. Yep. And the difference between faith and hope. Yep. And it says faith is being sure of what's hoped for. So I always saw his faith as something above that. Yeah. So why did you choose hope instead of, say, embracing faith in anxious times? I chose hope because what I find is it's a combination. They're, they're partners. You know, you have to have faith in the present to God and keep exercising. And faith is essentially faith exercised. Hope is faith exercised towards the future. But because hope is a word that the culture is struggling with, and hope is a struggle, is, is what the church is, I'm finding Christians are, are often are very fearful, full of dread, and a lot of belligerence and anger around, so be, hope is more, uh, it's also an attitude, it's an orientation, 
How many people can you think of that have a hopeful attitude? So, I mean, I do this the same. I, I can, I mean, trust me, the counsel of despair, it's very easy to talk yourself into the basement, isn't it? I mean, if you just go on a deep dive into the news cycle for a while, you just think, oh my goodness, I mean, look what's happened in Ukraine today, look what's happened in the Chinese economy, look what's happened in the stock market, blah, blah, and on and on it goes. There isn't much counsel for hope there. And again, it's not escapism. It's when the psalmist in Psalm 43 says, hope thou in God. It's not an idea, it's not a concept, it's in God. So Lord, I am looking for that city and that one day you're going to take me over the threshold. I will be home with you one day. Revelation 21. Take these pictures, meditate on them. Want a place where there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. It's gone. Forever. And who's that for? Us. That is the Christian hope. The resurrection of the dead. That's what Christ is, the firstborn of the new humanity. And we are attached to him. So I think that hope is to lift up so that faith goes towards the future. Keeping journeying forward, keeping moving towards the end. I think we got time for one more if there is one. Okay, two. Well, good. Okay, we'll do three and then okay. we'll call it from there. <laughs> three so is. So you asked one, so. A trinity of who, questions. Was it your hand? <laughs> Who's, yeah. One of the things that causes uh, a lot of us anxiety is our children. How do yeah. we. Um, protect our children from the influence of the culture. Okay, you've, you've raised a very, very big one, and you're right. One of the things that bothers, and I mean, I, we've, you know, as a Christian minister, we get calls all the time. And many of my friends have got kids who have, you know, kids who are playing with being transgender, who are being gay, or whatever it is. How do we protect them? The fact is, we can't. Now, that's not a counsel for despair, but remember where I started out, this pressure for control and for comprehension? And sometimes what we end up doing is because we try to, we seek all kinds of voices to get all the information. Why? So that I can order and control my children, and you'll never do it. Just like you can't do it with each other, just like you don't want anyone to do it for you either. Human beings have this massive desire for freedom. And the one way to get us to exercise is just tell someone, tell, don't do this, right? So how do we do it? Well, we, we, we use the, 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 the soft power of love. We do use the power of truth, but we don't do it in a preacher way. We try to get teaching moments. We ask for the wisdom, like the Proverbs, where we can bring life in. And we try to help them see consequences, but sometimes you're going to have to let them crash and burn. Because some people only learn through suffering. C.S. Lewis said, God speaks to us, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience. He shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So some people in their pleasures, they're hearing little whispers, they're ignoring them. Their conscience is speaking, they're ignoring it. The only thing they'll hear is pain. And sometimes that's a severe mercy, and that's what will come. So I would pray, I would show love, I would be there for a safety net, and say, I don't want you to hurt yourself, and I would, I'm here for you. But if you keep going where you're going, it's going to happen. And when it happens, I'll still be here for you. And that's, but you can't control the outcomes. That's the hard part. And so I bring my anxiety. Philippians 4, verse 6, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication. So we need both those. Lord, I'm desperate. I'm confused, I'm, I'm afraid, I don't know what to do. Well, remember Hannah praying in the temple and she ended up with a prophet. And he won't plug it, but the book that he has in the lobby, he co-wrote with his son on how faith is transferred from father to son. So that would be a great thing to read, to understand it from both perspectives. So yeah, I'll He wanted plug. to howl into the dark Nordic wind and join a black metal band, so... Yes, we had it's, our a great, it's a great story. <laughs> we had one over here, and then Abby to close up. One more hand here. Yes. Well, I've been sort of struggling to see how, we, how to address this question. But, uh, you know, we have, we have this also, we have this tension, the political tension, but we also have the tension, which you're giving more one side of it, but that do we just worry about the future and heaven and so forth, 
what about things on earth that have gone on? Because there are things that we can do things about. In the Christian church, sure. you know, the abolition of slavery in England yeah. and here. And there's a lot of um, issues here and um, that we can. The problem is we, we don't agree on, well, like just even in this state, uh, bail reform, which to, I yeah. don't, to me, it's, it's a, it should be done. But so other people would probably be on my neck. Uh, and uh, so how do we, you know, so that's, so we can abandon that. And uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, the, witness, the kids are, are leaving for different reasons, partly what they taught, but they've also seen that their church is neglected to address uh, a lot of issues. And, and they, they don't agree with uh, some of the things that some of our leaders have said. And so that's uh, how you resurrect that. I, I, I don't know how you get the balance because as soon as you move to practical solutions for some of the problems, people do not agree on that because they're sure. not easy solutions. But uh, if you stay simply in heaven, uh, I don't. If know, that's, that's what you heard me saying, that's not what I was saying at all. Yeah, no, okay. yeah. because that, that's not the way Abraham lived. But I'm saying, you know, you have to be able to live with the eternal and time together. You live with an eternal perspective in time. And the people who are the most heavenly minded have done the most good. You mentioned some of their names. People like William Wilberforce. People like Charles Finney. People like um, Adoniram Judson. People today who are out there in the field, they're not arguing and, and wondering about political parties. They're putting their life on the line going to China. They're smuggling Bibles into the Islamic world. They're, con they're translating texts. They're working in all kinds of places around the world. They're getting involved. So I'm not suggesting disengagement. But I think the thing is, uh, there's no grand strategy for the church because we are parts, of, there is a church, but there are churches, you're in one. This is a local one here. So the question is, what is the leadership doing in this church? What's the one next door doing? And you're not going to get them the same agenda. The pastors and leaders are going to have a vision and a calling for what God has put onto their congregation. We're trying to disciple our people to be salt and light where they are. The question is, what are you doing? And if you've got a group of people, you say, okay, I believe passionately before God. God is saying, I've got to reform reform the bail system. All right, well, you and, what about you and three or four people? That's what you're going to be doing for a number of years. Writing letters, attending meetings, talking to people, educating, helping. Thank you. So one more in that, is that okay? Yeah, Are we done? Oh, was it? right Andy, here. Sorry. Okay. Does apologetics play a role in our sharing our hope? Does apologetics, I have a problem these days with the word apologetics, only because, I mean, the Greek idea of apologia, to give, to give reasons for the hope, yes. But we are called, sometimes what has happened is that we've turned an industry of apologetics is about weaponizing truth sometimes to, to almost beat people up with it. I believe we're called to witness, and the apology would always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. That means you have to have the hope first, and people have to see it, and then be prepared. But if they're not asking you questions, it's not, we're not, should be, shouldn't be shoving things down the throat, right? So, yes, be ready, be winsome, be clear, and be truthful, and above all, be kind. God bless you. Thank, Thank you, Stuart.